Shriver, and we are here to look at books that have changed the world and can change even us. And I'm Gary Shriver, and this is the How to Love Lit podcast. Today, we conclude one of the most important memoirs to be written in the 20th century, Elie Wiesel's short narrative, Night. Uh, in our first episode, we focused on Wiesel's life and career after the Holocaust as a survivor. And episode two, we talked about chapters one and two. We discussed the Hungarian Holocaust in particular, and we focused on the role of the railways uh, as they enabled the industrialization of death. And last week, we focused on Auschwitz itself. We talked about Birkenau, the killing centers, and we focused on the events uh many evil, but also many good that Vizel highlighted the way love and kindness surfaced in those that survived and how that actually enabled him to survive. And we highlighted the role of God in the camps, the small acts of kindness, uh, perhaps the reflected divinity and literally saved lives. We saw men and women who expressed the power individuals have within themselves to resist being reduced to a spiritual nothing. And Vizel highlighted the evil, but also the resistance and the humanity, or divinity, if you will, in the heart of the inmates. And today, we are going to look at the rest of the book, but in a different way. But before we do, I do want to ask you, if you don't mind, please give us a rating on your podcast app. Turns out those things are pretty important for people like us. And if you like what we do, we would really appreciate it if you could support us. Uh, and also text your friends, tell them to do the same. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> anyway, back to this. Uh, the things that happened in Auschwitz obviously were horrible and beyond description. However, we are going to manage to take an even darker turn as we discuss the death marches, Gliwitz and Buchenwald and its liberation. We cannot avoid Wiesel's emphasis on malevolence as we see it in the end of the book. We see that it resides, it hides often in all human hearts and is capable of coming out of anyone. No one can claim any moral superiority, and we are all capable of great evil put under the right stressors. And it seems that even Vizel saw that within himself at the very end. I've heard the Canadian psychologist Jordan Peterson say that that's what PTSD is all about. And it's when life forces you to stare into evil, maybe even the evil in your own heart. But when you see it in others, and maybe understand that you are also capable of that it simply knocks you off your center of being war poetry shows a lot of the same thing that we talked about that when we discussed Uchi and de Cormet, because obviously soldiers are always looking at evil at others and in themselves looking at things like that it's deconstructing uh, World War II was certainly deconstructing, and really World War II was just the start of decades of systematic murders all over the world that deconstructed not just the Western world, but China and Russia and Africa and other parts of Asia as well. And uh, truly, it's impossible for us today to understand it. The, the numbers are simply too great. And of course, we can't talk about all the 20th century because just focusing on the events of World War II is too much for our brains to really comprehend. Uh, more than 70 million people died in that war, most of them civilians. And that means they weren't even officially involved in the war. Well, I know this is an aside, but as you know, I'm not a math oriented person. And numbers like that are often really abstract and difficult for me to even visualize, there's a wonderful book by David Schwartz designed to help kids conceptualize long numbers. And in his book, he makes the point that if you wanted to count to 1 million, it would take you 23 days to do that. Now think about that when we say that 70 million people died in that war. It is a mind-boggling perspective, and it's more than we can understand. And, of course, we know about uh, the assembly lines of death constructed in the Nazi killing centers as the Nazis systematically sought to annihilate an entire race of people. But there were more. Uh, millions died in combat. Many were burned alive by incendiary bombs. And, of course, we can never forget 
nuclear weapons. And all of this begs the obvious question of how in the world was such a sophisticated world able to create the kind of dehumanization which enabled or really empowered this much carnage? Well, I've heard Elie Wiesel give several lectures on this, obviously, from later on in his life. And one of the observations that he made fairly often as a way of warning us about how we could be capable of doing something like this was to point out the characteristics in the Nazi behavior during this era. Not to suggest that Nazis are different than the rest of us, because that's not true. He wants to point out that they're not. Uh, We are not different, and we're certainly not any better. He points out how advanced their science was and their technological research was very impressive. He points out that they had a high understanding and appreciation of literature and art and music. They're very cultured. In many ways, they're better than most of us, but none of this betterment was sufficient to restrain them from behaving inhumanely. What we see at Auschwitz is strange, and it's counterintuitive in almost every way. We see that the Nazis did actually operate based on values. Well, look what they did. They kept everything worth keeping. Clothes, suitcases, gold teeth. They even kept people's hair. They just didn't operate on moral values. They kept everything except human life. And when you listen to Fazel talk, the word morality comes up over and over again. The idea of preserving, preserving morality in our art, preserving morality in our politics, preserving morality in our speech. He sees this as mattering a great deal because somehow in Nazi Germany, morality was lost. And what the end of this book shows, perhaps among other things, is how this lack of morality has a coldness that increases in the face of its destruction, although you would think the opposite would occur. But we know from this story, as well as from many others, that it seems that as much as the war seemed to be turning against the Germans, the Nazis' commitment to death did not decrease at all. In fact, It hastened, we're going to see this in the story today, it hastened to levels that even they had not practiced yet. True. Uh, And as we know from other accounts, as the war became closer and closer to its conclusion, things in the concentration camps all over Poland and Germany got very chaotic and very deadly. And that brings us to Ellie. In January of 1945, The Russian army began approaching the Auschwitz-Birkenau complex. And of course, in the book, we see what was going on inside the camps as the Russians got closer. What Ellie expresses is a strange and ironic excitement when the bombs would drop. I know. When I read this, I think about that. How strange is the world when you are excited when bombs are dropping on you? Of course, they could kill you, but you're not even thinking about that. They're a source of hope because they're at the source of your liberation. True, and look at how the German mindset was even stranger. We know now that this is literally the last months of the Third Reich, and Hitler will kill himself April 30th, 1945, but even at that late date, in January 45, many Germans still believed that the tide of the war would turn in their favor, and when it did, They would need all these prisoners as slave laborers to rebuild all that was being destroyed through these battles. And so the strategy at Auschwitz, as well as other camps across Poland and Germany, was to uh, evacuate the prisoners deep into central Germany. And that's what they did. And this is what Ellie and his father were a part of. Uh, The SS evacuated a total of 250,000 prisoners, except They didn't have the resources to actually do that. So they made these prisoners, both men and women, march. And although the Vizelles march started in Auschwitz, many others started way, way before that. And by the time they got to Auschwitz to take a break, they were almost dead on arrival. There is such great irony at this part of the book for me. And of course, there's so much irony all over this book. I quit pointing it out because I was thinking I was sounding (laughs) redundant. redundant, Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. But I think it's 
worth bringing up again one more time. Ellie had gotten hurt at work um, toting these stones back and forth. Well, and, and let me interrupt here because it's worth mentioning. Uh, remember how we talked about how evil is uh, often characterized by just being pointless? This is a great example of that. I mean, the Nazis were notorious about giving their prisoners tasks that were absolutely grueling as well as pointless. And they would have them literally kill themselves to lift rocks and haul them from one place to another just to turn around and have them move them back. Ugh. Well, we're not told really exactly what the nature of Ellie's work hauling was, or rock hauling, I guess, was. But he does mention earlier that the work in Buna was basically pretty pointless no matter what they would, were doing. But he hurts his foot, and when this happens, he's got to go to the infirmary. Now, if you can imagine how this would be utterly horrifying, going to a hospital in a place that industrializes death cannot be reassuring in any way. But ironically, it actually was a good place. His doctor was Jewish, uh, and performed a surgery on them. The the doctor got his dad to sneak in, or I guess transferred there as an orderly. They got better food. His foot was going to heal. And he was told that while he was healing, he would be able to lay in bed for two weeks. And this is a guy that had been toting rocks. So, oh, and he does mention that he had sheets. So all is looking, I'm not going to say on the up and up, because, you know, you're still in this terrible place. But... It's a reprieve, but only for two days, because then comes the German evacuation. He's going to recount that the patients in the hospital are actually given a choice. They could stay in the hospital and wait on the Russians, or they can choose to be evacuated with all the other inmates and march in the snow to wherever those guys were going to end up going. Well, um, at first pass, that would seem like an obvious choice, which was stay. I mean, you can be free. But after the first thought, you have to have the second thought, and that one would be terrifying. What are the SS going to do on the way out the door? Uh, They were already blowing up crematoriums, getting rid of evidence of their crimes, and it's clear that they didn't want witnesses. How easy would it be just to shoot everyone in a hospital bed right before walking out? It's a gamble one way or another. Well, obviously, that's the decision and the thoughts that were going through all of the inmates' minds. And depending on how bad off they were, maybe they didn't even have a choice. There certainly had been nothing in the behavior of the SS to indicate that there would be a moment of mercy at the very end. But you have to think how terrified Ellie would have been to be motivated. He had just operated on his leg, and now he's going to try to walk what was going to be, although he didn't know it at that moment, 55 kilometers and not walk run the 30 miles to Gleewitz. it was not going to be good and of course what ellie was to find out many years later tragically really is that had they stayed back they would have lived when the soviets walked into that camp the 6,000 sick inmates were still alive and were immediately liberated You know, when I think about that, when I read this book, all the missed opportunities in the first chapter and now here is yet another one. But Ellie and his father are going to join the 60,000, again, these numbers, plus inmates that are evacuated from Auschwitz. I can't even imagine. When you think about a number like 60,000, well, we live in a suburb of Memphis that has 58,000 inhabitants. That would be our entire town marching out in the snow in the middle of winter without proper coats. Ellie really didn't even have a shoe that fit. He, his foot was swollen. And it's at the end of this chapter on Ellie's last day at Auschwitz where we see one more passage that to me powerfully illustrates man's ability to resist dehumanization. And I want to point this out before we start talking about man's great ability to become overcome by evil because there is both in this book. There is the emphasis on man's ability to fight evil, and then there's the man's ability to succumb to it. But their block leader made them mop the floor on their way out, which I find amazing. They're going to march in the snow, but before they do, they have to mop. One of the inmates is going to ask, 
why they have to do this. And let me quote his response. The block leader says this, for the liberating army, let them know that here lived men and not pigs. Wow. Incredible. Well, the evacuation was unbearably tedious as well as chaotic, and they made the half-starved inmates run for their lives, and to the incredible capacity of the human spirit, they did. They ran, even though the German soldiers couldn't keep up. Uh, They continued running. If they saw someone drop off or fall back, the orders were just to kill them. They ran until they got to Gleewitz, and from there, they were locked in rooms waiting to be loaded on open cattle cars to the interior of Germany. You know, when I read this part of the book, they run, they stop, they have to stop, stay in barns where they're freezing, and they run more. I have a question that always runs in my head, especially when I visualize them running in the dark. I think, well, I would have been tired. Why don't you just fall and hide in the grass and let let the s just kind of not see you can't you get away weren't the russians coming isn't it dark now, that's a great question uh, that i think a lot of people would have reading this book and actually that did happen some but not really as much as you would think and john rands uh, another survivor of the death marches when he tells his story kind of answers that question and Because of his place at the camp, he had the unique privilege of reading newspapers that the Nazis were using as toilet paper. Uh, So he could read the strips of paper he had access to. Uh, When he tells a story, he talks a little bit about the propaganda that the Nazi media was putting out. And the media of Germany was not calling the German retreat death marches like we're calling them. They were calling them victorious withdrawals, which they're not the only people to use that idea when they're losing. The Germans were supposed to believe that the Germans were deliberately luring the Russians deeper into the Reich in order to encircle and completely destroy them. He states that he heard Germans shouting to bystanders as they marched by that all those with machine guns or Panzerfaust units were to report to the front. And the Panzerfaust units were regarded as uh, Germany's great hope to stop the Russian tanks. And the newspapers were full of stories of soldiers who had single-handedly knocked out dozens of enemy tanks. And uh, it, it wasn't an accepted fact that this war was over. You also have to remember these prisoners saw all the Germans as potential assailants. They understood that most of the people in the area would be hostile towards them in any peasant could kill one of them and likely would. And the, the prisoners, and you can see this from the way Ellie tells a story, actually felt safer within the confines of the marching prisoners than lost and alone in German territory. They saw that there was no place to hide even if they escaped the SS. Plus, and don't forget this, the German people had great faith in what they called the Wunderwaffe or the miracle weapon. It was their belief, because Hitler kept talking about it, that any day this weapon was going to be unleashed and protect them from collapse. Is the Wunderwaffe uh, the nuclear bomb? Uh, Yes, I think we can assume that. I mean, Hitler had many physicists working competitively all over the Reich trying to enrich uranium, uh, but obviously they failed. And, of course, if they'd gotten that weapon first instead of the United States... um, Who knows? Who knows, yes. Well, for the rest of the book, most of the stories that Wiesel recounts are not stories of kindness. Instead, they're illustrations of great and intense evil beyond even what he had seen at Auschwitz, maybe, although that's probably nothing you can compare anything to. And not all of them were done by Germans. Many of the things that were done were done by Jewish prisoners to each other. He highlights an incident about a young man abandoning his father in the run, the Rabbi Elihu, and he highlights the SS stuffing the prisoners in cars without covers, over 100 in each one, and they would have to stand there for days in the falling rain with no food or water, just trying to eat snow off of each other's bodies to keep liquid in their bodies. Well, in this misery, he highlights an account where they would stop uh, at a village, the train would stop, And people in the village would throw bread into the car. And that sounds like an act of compassion, but mostly it was just to watch what the inmates would do. And what the inmates would do is they would kill each other for the bread. And they were just a few crumbs of it. 
All of these stories take us to one common, common theme. And of course, I didn't even mention the story where one man literally kills his own father who had a piece of bread. The theme is not to show us how horrible the train ride was. Of course, that's evident and hardly worth making a point of. There's a greater point to be made. And we know this because it's he stops telling the story of this horrific train ride from Greenwich to Buchenwald to flash forward into a post-war episode, which is a strange point to make. He stops the story to tell another story about a Parisian woman on a cruise ship. It seems that he was on this cruise in the Middle East and it stopped for one of these excursions like cruise ships do. And apparently they were at this port city called Aden, which is in Yemen. And Yemen is a very poor co- country. And at this point uh, in his life, Wazel is older. He's grown up. But he watches this woman throw coins at poor children. And while she did it, she didn't throw enough for all of them. But she threw coins at the children and enjoyed watching them strangle each other to get the coins. Of course, Vazel, maybe he remembers this part of his life, but he becomes very upset by that, and he mentions something to the woman. And she responds with this, I think, insensitive remark, and she says, and I quote, I enjoy giving to charity. And so when you read this story in the middle of this other story, you have to wonder, what does the Parisian woman have in common with this wretched cattle car story about Germans throwing bread in the cattle cars to watch Jews kill each other? Well, he doesn't really tell you in the memoir. He makes you work for the answer. But of course, any student of Vizel knows what he thinks. Uh, Vizel argues that evil expresses itself first and foremost in indifference. Uh, we talked about it being voluntary and unnecessary. It's also indifferent. And it seems to be something that can be in all of us anywhere at any level. And the woman in the story got some sort of pleasure from watching the degradation of the children. And she was able to justify it uh, because she was throwing money. Well, I agree. It's a theme we read about. And I've heard not just from Wazelle and not even just from Holocaust survivors, but many survivors of the 20th century genocides talk about this indifference, this dehumanization, this deep and disturbing question, and they raise the question and talk about the challenge of answering it. And the question is, why are people so evil? Where does that come from? Well, we're not going to be able to answer that today, Uh, but lots of great minds have addressed it. Uh, It's at the heart of the book of Genesis and the Bible, and Plato talked about it in the Greek traditions, and St. Augustine, um, the the Christian philosopher, in his important work, Confessions, had a lot to say about this, and all these writers predate the 20th century, but the 20th century was full of expressions of absolute evil that challenged what we thought we were and what we thought we were becoming. We had learned how to fly, how to make light, how to communicate across space, but look what we've done with our advancements. And of course, that begs the question, are we on the verge of destroying ourselves? And that kind of brings me to the ideas of Alexander Solzhenitsyn here, another Nobel Prize winner. And I do want to talk about him in his own right in a later episode. But one of the most famous quotes I've ever heard from him comes out of his book, The Gulag Archipelago. And it reminds me, because it illustrates for me, well, Ellie is illustrating the same idea that Solzhenitsyn has as he discusses this ride to Buchenwald. Well, before you read his quote, um, I think it's worth mentioning that Solzhenitsyn was a distinguished and celebrated soldier in the Red Army. Uh, This very Red Army that we're talking about marching through Poland. So he's on the liberating side of this. But as a soldier, um, he was a murderer himself, and he'd done horrible things all in the name of the war effort. But what happened to him was that Stalin found out that he had uh, said disparaging things about Stalin. So Solzhenitsyn was sent to the Russian gulags or Russian concentration camps. So he had the unique experience of being both the perpetrator of evil as well as a victim of it. And well, this is what he has to say. In my most evil moments, I was convinced that I was doing good, and I was well supplied with systematic arguments. 
It was only when I lay there on rotting prison straw that I sensed within myself the first stirrings of good. Gradually, it was disclosed to me that the line separating good and evil passes not through states, nor between classes, nor between political parties either, but right through every human heart and through all human hearts. This line shifts. Inside us, it oscillates with the years and Even within our hearts, overwhelmed by evil, one small bridgehead of good is retained. And even in the best of all hearts, there remains an uprooted small corner of evil. He goes on to say, Since then, I have come to understand the truth of all the religions of the world. They struggle with the evil inside a human being, inside every human being. It is impossible to expel evil from the world in its entirety. But... It is possible to constrict it within each person. Well, it's very similar language to what we're going to hear from Vizel as he talks against ideologies later in life. Vizel was absolutely against and spoke against all ideologies, whatever it is, whatever kind of ism you wanted to give it. They are great excuses for man to allow evil uh, to live unrestrained inside his heart. The final chapters of this book are about the death of Shlomo Vazel. Eli's father just cannot survive the death march, although he does make it to Boothenwald. He doesn't last there very long. Once they get there, it's just a matter of time before dysentery takes his life. Gary, give us the historical and context, because when I heard the word Buchenwald, I really didn't know where that was or what it was. And after we learn what this place is, we'll end with the story of how Ellie's father passed, and then, of course, Ellie's liberation. Uh, sure. Uh, Buchenwald is located in eastern Germany. It's about 150 miles south of Berlin. And if you Google map that today, we're talking about uh, 453 miles if you're driving directly. And on highways, even today, it would take you about 12 hours of solid driving under the best of circumstances to get from Auschwitz to Buchenwald. And of course, we know it took the Vizels days of being outside in the exposed winter snow. And technically, Buchenwald was never a killing center. Its primary function was forced labor. And it was the, the first and largest of the German concentration camps. It didn't have any gas chambers, although that's not to say lots of inmates didn't die there. We know that at least um, 56,545 were documented as dying there. But let me highlight, because I don't know if we have really, the Nazis established over 44,000 labor camps of one kind or another during the course of the war. And again, those numbers are hard to imagine. And the reason that we even know about this is because uh, in order to be so incredibly efficient and create such an intricate system, the Germans, by necessity, had to keep meticulous and enormous amounts of records. Therefore, um, as, a, as a result, even though we see here at the end, as they were blowing up camps and destroyed records and so forth, they were never able to succeed in hiding all the evidence. And the German genocide is by far the most documented genocide in human history. And also, and we see this in Wiesel's book, but also in other accounts uh, beyond the German records, There was a testimony of many witnesses, and beyond just the tragedy of death involved, uh, we learned about the procedures and the organization of the camps, and so we know a lot about these camps. And I know this is an aside, but it's an aside worth mentioning that there was a man by the name of David Boder, a Russian immigrant to the United States, and a professor of psychology at the Illinois Institute of Technology, and he traveled uh, to Europe in 1946 for the uh, express purpose of making a permanent record of the witnesses. And he collected over 100 interviews, totaling about 120 hours of interview on a wire recorder. And this was just after it had all happened. Uh, This is an extremely important document of history. And his work was never really famous at the time. His book titled, uh, I Did Not Interview the Dead, was not famous but he accurately recorded what actually happened. And I recommend anyone interested in Holocaust research to go Google his name and listen to the work that he did. Uh, but back to Buchenwald. Uh, if you remember, 
Ellie and his father were evacuated in January of 1945, the Americans marched into a pretty much SS-free camp on April 11th of that year. And when Patton's army uh, got a few miles outside of the camp, almost all of the 5,000 plus SS soldiers ran for their lives. And once they did that, the inmates themselves liberated the camp. Ella records how he saw this from the inside. It's incredible how close Ellie's father came to surviving the war. But again, as the Americans uh, approached Buchenwald, the Nazis did at Buchenwald what they'd done at Auschwitz. When the Russians got close, they tried to evacuate the camp, except this time Ellie didn't participate. And it feels like that the reason that he didn't is just that he had no more feeling of humanity left in him. His father had died and the love between these two had basically been what they were living off of, as we can see clearly in the narrative. The death of Ellie's father just absolutely destroys him. When his father becomes delirious, uh, he loses it and he has diarrhea and he can't stop screaming. He can't stop the dehydration. Where in Auschwitz, Ellie tells us stories of human compassion. At this point here at Buchenwald, we don't see any of that. The block leader of this block is going to give Ellie advice on how to survive Buchenwald. You remember this happened when they got to Auschwitz too, and the block leader told them to take care of each other. But this block leader gives the opposite advice. And this is how, this is what he says. And I want to read. A week went by like this. Is this your father? Asked the block testi. Yes, he is very sick. The doctor won't do anything for him. He looked me straight in the eye. The doctor cannot do anything more for him, and neither can you. He placed his big hairy hand on my shoulder and added, Listen to me, kid. Don't forget that you're in a concentration camp. In this place, it is every man for himself, and you cannot think of others, not even your father. In this place, there is no such thing as a father, a brother, a friend. Each of us lives and dies alone. Let me give you good advice. Stop giving your ration of bread and soup to your old father. He cannot help, you cannot help him anymore. And you're hurting yourself. In fact, you should be getting his rations. I listened to him without interrupting. He was right. I thought deep down, not daring to admit it to myself. Too late to save your old father. You could have two rations of bread, two rations of soup. It was only a fraction of a second, but it left me feeling guilty. I ran to get some soup and brought it to my father, but he did not want it. All he wanted was water. Don't drink water. Eat the soup. I'm burning up. Why are you so mean to me, my son? Water. I brought him water. Then I left the block for roll call, but I quickly turned back. I laid down on the upper bunk. The sick were allowed to stay in the block, so I would be sick. I didn't want to leave my father. All around me, there was silence now, broken only by moaning. In front of the block, the SS were giving orders. An officer passed between the bunks. My father was pleading, My son, water, I'm burning up my insides. Silence over there, barked the officer. Eliezer, continued my father, water. The officers came closer and shouted to him to be silent, but my father did not hear. He continued to call me. The officer wielded his club and dealt him a violent blow to the head. I didn't move. I was afraid. My body was afraid of another blow, this time to my head. My father groaned once more. I heard, Eliezer. I could see that he was still breathing in gasps. I didn't move. When I came down from my bunk after roll call, I could see his lips trembling. He was murmuring something. I remained more than an hour, leaning over him, looking at him, etching his bloody, broken face into my mind. Then I had to go to sleep. I climbed into my bunk, above my father, who was still alive. The date was January 28, 1945. I woke up at dawn on January 29. On my father's cot, there lay another sick person. They must have taken him away before daybreak and taken him to the crematorium. Perhaps he was still breathing. No prayers were said over his tomb. No candle lit in his memory. His last word had been my name. He had called out to me, and I had not answered. I did not weep, and it pained me that I could not weep. But I was out of tears, and deep inside me, if I could have searched for the recesses of my feeble conscience, I might have found something like free at last. Well, uh, of course, 
we feel nothing but sympathy for little Elie Wiesel at that point. And the circumstances of his father's death is beyond anything anyone I know could ever even sympathize with. But what Wiesel highlights is that um, he found in his own heart darkness as well at that moment. Uh, he felt apathy, and it seems like this felt like evil to him. And his first emotion was not sadness, but relief. And he was not sad at the death of his own father. He was, in fact, dehumanized. And later, he came to feel guilty about it. It seems to perhaps even frighten him. It does seem to have frightened him, although he surely didn't have the words to voice any of that in the camp. But later in life, as Wazell has had years to reflect and consider on the things that he's witnessed, this is what he has to say. I've always thought that the opposite of culture is not ignorance, but indifference. That the opposite of morality is not immorality, but again, indifference. And I think that must have been what he felt. Perhaps it was the feeling of indifference, and he felt that, and he understood it to be evil, and that darkness, and that was something that he had seen all over the camps. The Nazis were the absolute expression of evil, because they were the absolute expression of complete indifference. Hmm. Well, as you know, Elie Wiesel was to spend the rest of his life advocating for peace, and he never advocated for revenge, not even on the children of Nazis, as you might expect. And he advocated that the way to fight indifference was to care and to be kind and to express empathy. And this is not a matter of state policy, although it does involve that too, but as a matter of personal choice. And another point to make, and he says this way later in life, almost at the end, he said he did not really believe we would achieve it, really. He didn't think we'd learned much from the 20th century. And uh, David Axelrod interviewed him at the uh, University of Chicago, and he acknowledged this, and he admits, and to use his words, he says, the world learns nothing. Uh, however, in, in spite of all that, he still believed in humanity, and he was a teacher who loved his students, and he believed in the future. And he believed that we could combat indifference, and we should, and we must, knowing, like Solzhenitsyn, that it will never be eradicated, but it can be constrained. He famously said that hope is the memory of the future, and I really like that turn of phrase. It's a paradox, and it's beautiful. I believe in that hope, too. It's the legacy of Elie Wiesel, this legacy of kindness and compassion lived out, not judging or condemning others in the name of an ism, but fighting indifference through our actions. And so in that spirit, I think it's fitting that we end our discussion of night by reading Elie Wiesel's speech that he made the night that he accepted the Nobel Peace Prize. Although he died in 2016, his words do live on, as does his witness, as does his hope. Gary, let's finish by reading his speech. It is with a profound sense of humility that I accept the honor you have chosen to bestow upon me. I know your choice transcends me, and this both frightens and pleases me. It frightens me because I wonder, do I have the right to represent the multitudes who have perished? Do I have the right to accept this great honor on their behalf? I do not. That would be presumptuous. No one may speak for the dead, and no one may interpret their mutilated dreams and visions. It pleases me because I may say that this honor belongs to all the survivors and their children, and through us to the Jewish people with whose destiny I've always identified. I remember... It happened yesterday or eternities ago. A young Jewish boy discovered the kingdom of night. I remember his bewilderment. I remember his anguish. It all happened so fast. The ghetto, the deportation, the sealed cattle car, the fiery altar upon which the history of our people and the future of mankind were meant to be sacrificed. I remember, he asked his father, can this be true? This is the 20th century, not the Middle Ages. Who would allow such crimes to be committed? How could the world remain silent? And now the boy is turning to me. Tell me, he asks, what have you done with my future? What have you done with your life? And I tell him that I have tried. 
that have tried to keep memory alive, that I have tried to fight those who would forget. Because if we forget who the guilty are, we are accomplices. And then I explained to him how naive we were, that the world did know and remain silent. And that is why I swore never to be silent when and wherever human beings endure suffering and humiliation. We must always take sides. Neutrality helps the oppressor, never the victim. Silence encourages the tormentor, never the tormented. Sometimes we must interfere. When human lives are endangered, when human dignity is in jeopardy, national borders and sensitivities become irrelevant. Whenever men or women are persecuted because of their race, religion, or political views, that must, at that moment, become the center of the universe. Yes, I have faith. Faith in God and even in His creation. Without it, no action would be possible. And action is the only remedy to indifference, the most insidious danger of all. Isn't this the meaning of Alfred Nobel's legacy? Wasn't his fear of war a shield against war? There is much to be done. There is much that can be done. One person of integrity can make a difference. A difference between life and death. As long as one dissident is in prison, our freedom will not be true. As long as one child is hungry, our lives will be filled with anguish and shame. What all these victims need above all is to know that they are not alone, that we are not forgetting them, that when their voices are stilled, we shall lend them ours, that while their freedom depends on ours, the quality of our freedom depends on theirs. This is what I say to the young Jewish boy, wondering what have I done with his years. It is in his name that I speak to you, and I express to you my deepest gratitude. No one is capable of gratitude as one who has emerged from the kingdom of night. We know that every moment is a moment of grace, every hour an offering. Not to share them would mean to betray them. Our lives no longer belong to us alone. They belong to all those who need us desperately. Thank you, Chairman Arvik. Thank you, members of the Nobel Committee. Thank you, people of Norway, for declaring on this singular occasion that our survival has meaning for mankind. On those words, we can say, peace out. Peace out.